Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the University of Massachusetts Lowell. It is an honor for us to be able to sponsor this debate tonight with the Boston Herald. Thank you to all of you for being here. I want to welcome all of our students who are here, welcome those students who are from other colleges and universities who are here. I want to thank our students that are going to be introduced in a minute uh, on our panel, and we thank you for your participation here. Uh, I want to thank the publisher of the Herald, uh, Pat Purcell, as well as the editor, Joe Shocker. Thanks very much for that uh, partnership. We appreciate uh, the opportunity to work with you. Uh, here at the University of Massachusetts, we're looking to engage our students in a civic way, and we've been sponsoring debates, we've been sponsoring polls, we've been engaging our student body in trying to get them to focus on the major issues that are confronting this country and confronting the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And we have been actively engaged in the United States Senate races, and there have been a lot of them lately. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to have our, our two candidates uh, here, and they are both uh, former colleagues of mine, and they are both very good friends of mine, and I know both of them personally, and both of them would be great United States Senators from Massachusetts. Um, it's my job now to introduce our moderator, Jacqueline Cashman. Uh, she's been a veteran TV moderator uh, in, uh, in uh, Massachusetts. Welcome. Great to have you here. Uh, please engage. Uh, not only uh, in terms of this election, but uh, we are delighted to pr present our students in a way that you will see. Their students have been great. They are the future of this country. Thank you very much. Jacqueline. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, UMass Lowell, for hosting tonight's debate. We're going to have a great conversation here tonight, and helping to make that happen is a bunch of brilliant students who have worked very hard to come up with some challenging questions, hoping to keep the candidates on their toes tonight. Now, as moderator, I do reserve the right to ask some follow-up questions if I deem it necessary throughout the debate, but you at home can also be a part of the conversation by hopping onto Twitter and asking some questions using our hashtag UMLDebate. Let's start by welcoming the candidates. Congressman Stephen Lynch of South Boston, representing the 8th District of Massachusetts since 2001. And Congressman Edward Markey of Malden, representing the 5th District of Massachusetts since 1976. And now, the future U.S. Senators, our panel of students. We're going to start now by introducing the students up here. We have Corey Lanier, is a junior, double majoring in political science and criminal justice, with a minor in psychology. He was responsible for bringing back the political science science club on campus. Maria Christina Garvin is a senior majoring in biology. She is currently interning at the University of Massachusetts Medical School where she is doing research on type 2 diabetes. And John Asagba, he is a senior majoring in peace and conflict studies. John attended university in his native Ghana prior to transferring to UMass Lowell. We want to thank you all for coming up with some great questions tonight and I'd like everyone to give us a round of applause for the students. Thank, and we'd like to thank you for your great enthusiasm tonight, but we ask the audience to please now hold your applause until the end of the debate, so that way we can get in as many questions as possible over the next 45 minutes. Each candidate will get one minute to respond to each question, and then at the end of the debate, each candidate will get one minute for some ending remarks. So, best of luck to the candidates. Both of you have signed the People's Pledge to keep spending by independent groups outside of the special election. However, so far we've seen about $1.25 million spent by outside parties in this special election. We've had about a half a million dollars from the League of Conservation Voters, which has helped Congressman Markey, and then we've had the International Association of Firefighters help Congressman Lynch. About $85,000 was spent. And the question is, doesn't this violate the spirit of the People's Pledge? You guys have both ask them to stay out of the race, but they're not listening. So why not just let outside money into the race? We're going to begin with Congressman Lynch. Sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the UMass Lowell family for inviting us here. I want to thank Ed for his attendance. And uh, I want to offer my congratulations to the University of Lowell Riverhawks, who are uh, going to uh, the Frozen Four. Uh, let, let me just say that uh, 
the the uh, outside expenditures are quite different here. Um, in uh, in the firefighters' case, they're basically out there uh, holding signs. So they've they've paid for a bus that uh, has a big picture of me uh, on the side of it, and they they ride around. Uh, they've got uh, uh, they have fire departments in 351 cities and towns. Uh, they did the same exact thing for for Liz Warren, and and she was part of the the People's Pledge. So. I really think that uh, what they're doing is is a positive, uh, uh, is trying to portray a positive reflection of, of my candidacy, I guess. And uh, I, I think what we're really trying to get at, Ed and I, and, and I'm proud that we're both part of the People's Pledge. I, th I think what we were trying to get at is the outside money that might criticize Ed on my behalf or criticize me on Ed's behalf. And I think, for the most part, I think the People's Pledge has really worked well in that regard. Rebuttal? Thank you. And uh, again, congratulations to uh, Mighty Meehan, this world-class university, uh, and the Riverhawks. We want them to win the Frozen Four. That's one thing Steve and I agree upon 100%. And, uh, and to the Boston Herald, thank you for holding this very important discussion. Um, yeah, I agree with Steve. Um, uh, we're, we're living within the spirit of what Scott Brown, to his credit, and Elizabeth Warren established as a standard uh, in 2012. Uh, and that made us a special state, separate from the other 49 states. The sad thing, this year, all three Republican candidates have all said they are not going to accept the People's Pledge. They're going to allow for undisclosed, unlimited amounts of money to come in. Cal Rove, the Koch brothers, Big Coal, the NRA, all able to bring an undisclosed amount of unlimited money. And that's just wrong. And that's why, in my opinion, the one issue that unites everything uh, in this campaign is that we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission. We have to make sure that we stop what these three Republican candidates want to bring to the state of Massachusetts in just 22 days to Scott's, Scott Brown's credit. He rejected that money. But how are the Koch brothers any different from, let's say, this California billionaire who is renting planes with these banners that are insulting uh, Congressman Lynch? And you had mentioned, Congressman Lynch, that um, in the spirit, if uh, the firefighters, for instance, that they are doing work uh, in, toward you that is not against Markey, but that's not the case with this California well, business, uh, this it, business there is man. No, there is no difference between Tom Steyer uh, flying a plane around or, or threatening me, threatening me, saying that, uh, look, I'm waiting for the final environmental impact report on the Keystone project, uh, along with the president, along with Senator Kerry. Tom Steyer, though, is saying, I want you to take a position before that report is out. I want it now, and this is what I want, and, and I will crush you. Those are his words. I will crush you if you don't change your position by high noon last Friday. But how That's ridiculous. That no, no elected official who has responsibility for representing people just because he has a billion dollars doesn't mean he gets to push people around. But I've faced it... bullies my whole life, and I won't put up with that. But hasn't your position changed a little bit in terms of the Keystone oil pipeline? You were at first saying you were in favor of it, and now you're saying you're waiting for the environmental study to come out. Hasn't well, changed I, a little bit? I would bit? like the process to go for. I actually think that, that they've dragged their feet on this project. I think there's actually... We've got to make a decision. If it's a good project, say so in the report. If it's a bad project, say so in the report. That'll at least give us some, some facts and, and figures to base our opinion from. And that, that process, in my opinion, has gone on far too long. I think, I think we have to make a decision one way or the other and, and, make, a, you know, and make, make a final decision whether to go forward with the project or not. Jacqueline, my, may I say, Jacqueline, that on day one, I said to Mr. Steyer, Stay out of our state. I repudiated that money on day one. I do not want that money into this state. Uh, but again, let's just keep coming back to the Republicans. All three of them say they're going to welcome all of this undisclosed, unlimited amount of money. Uh, and that's going to turn this state into the same kind of politically polluted you know, democratic discussion that the other states had to suffer through in 2012. And that's really, in my opinion, 
what's going to be at the heart of this general election. Uh, it's whether or not the Republicans are going to allow that decision, Citizens United, to allow them to shield, to hide uh, where all this oil, in my opinion, oil, NRA, coal, money, uh, to, where it comes from, uh, to be injected into the United States Senate race in Massachusetts because they know that if that money was ever fully disclosed, it would basically disqualify a Republican from being elected in the state of Massachusetts. Let's stay with Keystone for a second here. Now, you are not in favor of this proposal. However, um, one of your key uh, personnel that have been very helpful in your uh, fundraising efforts, Larry Rask, now is working in, in trying to help with that pipeline. So how does that work for you? Here's my opinion. This oil up in Alberta, Canada, is the dirtiest oil in the world. The Canadians want to build a pipeline through our country, with the United States having to run all the environmental risks. We just saw the accident in Arkansas uh, going through neighborhoods in a town. And then they want that pipeline to come down to Port Arthur, Texas, a tax-free export zone. And then the Canadians and the oil companies say they won't pledge to keep the oil here they want the right to export that oil out of but, the United States as we have to export young men and women in order to, in the military, in order to bring oil in from the Middle East. And I just think that's wrong. We take all the environmental risk the and we do not though. get any of the benefits from that oil having come through our country. Th thank you, Congressman. But I would like you to answer the question about, with, uh, in terms of Rasky, you do have a relationship with him, so how does that work? I mean, should you be aligning yourself with somebody that's in favor of this pipeline? Look, it. my record is very clear on this issue. Uh, and anyone else is free to have their own view on it, Steve as well. But in terms of my position, it's been very clear right from the very beginning, and it doesn't make any difference to me whether one of my supporters might have a different view. The only person whose name is on the ballot is mine. And I want everyone out there to know that I do not think it is a good idea to build the Keystone Pipeline. Thank, I do not think it much. is in America's best interest. Thank you very much, Congressman. Now let's turn it over to the student panel. We will start with Corey, and Corey will be asking a question, and Congressman Markey will answer it first. Thank you. Uh, Representative Markey, you voted in favor of the Affordable Care Act, but you acknowledge there are some problems with it. If given the chance, can you name three elements you'd like to change about this act? Uh, thank you, Corey. Um, well, the vote for the Affordable Care Act um, is the proudest vote of my congressional career. Uh, and that's because, obviously, it's the fulfillment of the vision of Ted Kennedy and, and Barack Obama to provide health care for every child, to make sure that if you had a pre-existing condition that you could not be denied uh, coverage, that if you became sick, your family would not become bankrupt. But you know, there are provisions in there, including a tax on medical devices, uh, which I think uh, could be looked at in order to um, relieve that tax burden. But I would not want that to happen um, without ensuring that it did not harm poor people uh, in our state or across the country. Uh, and I also want more cost containments uh, in that legislation ultimately, and that's why it's great that Massachusetts has passed new cost containment legislation to be the model for how to handle that issue in the same way that we were the model for putting health care insurance on the book seven years ago. So we continue to be that model, and I believe that over the years we'll be able to make the adjustments that continue to perfect that legislation. Congressman Lynch? Sure, and I would ask for equal time on this. I know I'm, I'm a little bit behind on the time. Uh, great question, Corey. Great question. There are, there are three major flaws in the, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there were two health care bills. Uh, this is the one I voted for. This is the one I voted against. The one that, that I voted for had three important elements. One, it took away the antitrust exemption for insurance companies that allows them to operate as, as cartels or monopolies. It actually allows them to keep prices artificially high in restraint of trade. In the bill that I voted for, we stripped that away from the insurance companies, number one. The second thing we did in the bill that I, that, that I, I supported and voted for, Obamacare 1, uh, it actually put in a state-run public option that actually would allow states to operate and put out, push out 
uh, low-cost health care plans that would force those insurance companies. Now, there's 27 states that have two or three insurance companies that, are, that control the entire market, so there's no competition there. The, the, the uh, state-run public option would allow the states, like Massachusetts, to offer a low-cost competitive plan that would force the insurance companies to compete. As people started to sign up for this low-cost plan, the insurance companies would have to drop their prices. And then the third thing that we voted uh, to, to refrain from in the, in the good act that I passed was we didn't tax health care. We didn't tax health care because... Thank you, like Congressman. Food. No, 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 no. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't have equal time here. You, you let other, other people go on far longer than I have, okay? Now, in closing, let me just say this. The Affordable Care Act did three things. It, one, it gave the antitrust exemption back to the insurance companies that allows them to operate a monopoly, number one. Number two, it took out the public option, the only thing in the bill that actually introduced competition. And number three, it piled about 14 new taxes on health care, which is why employers today are running away, running away from their health care obligations. Thank, thank you very much, Congressman. Jacqueline, <laughs> Jacqueline, Jacqueline, we, we actually, Jacqueline, we had equal time on that last issue. And, uh, and, we, and if I don't get a chance to speak here, there will not be equal time on this issue. And all I want to say, and I don't need a lot of time. We've just uh, started. The, we're already fighting. Well, the only, the only, the only option uh, when we were voting was an option to vote for that bill that ensured that every child had health care, to make sure that uh, being a woman was no longer a pre-existing condition, uh, to make sure that to make sure that there was uh, prescription drug benefits for senior citizens in our country. Every single Republican voted no on that bill. Steve voted no on that bill. And I just don't think he should be able to run away from his record on this because that's how he voted on that issue. And President Obama, Ted Kennedy, our whole delegation, that's the bill that we wanted. And thank thank that you very much. Let's, let's try to move forward if you don't mind. Thank you vote. very much. Maria, it's your turn, and you'll start with Congressman Lynch. Thank you. Um, this is for Representative Lynch. You say that you oppose abortion, but you also say Roe v. Wade should not be overturned. How can we trust that you will vote in the Senate to protect women's rights, knowing your personal beliefs? Well, l let me be clear on this. I, I said I consider myself to be pro-life. And uh, I know there are folks out there that have criticized me and said that, that I'm not pro-life or I'm not pro-life enough. And I have said to them, I am not, I don't pretend to be an expert on church teaching, but I am an expert on what I believe. And what I do believe is that overturning Roe v. Wade doesn't end abortion. There will still be abortions if we were to overturn Roe v. Wade. What it will do, however, is change uh, the options for women from a clinical setting to one that is much more dangerous for women in crisis. That's why my position in Congress, I've taken the floor of the House of Representatives. When, when, when the Republicans were trying to zero out the budget for Roe v. Wade, excuse me, for, for Planned Parenthood, I actually took the floor. And, uh, you know, I believe that the way to reduce abortions in this country is to make sure that, that contraceptive care is, is available to every woman and that, that uh, we have uh, birth control counseling for, for women. And oddly enough, in the last two years, we have the maximum uh, availability for contraceptives and the maximum availability for birth control counseling. We've actually, for the first time in 40 years, dropped the number of abortions in this country as well. So that's, that's the way we should be proceeding. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. For 30 years, I have voted consistently to ensure that a woman has a right to choose. And she has a right to choose in consultation with her family uh, and with her physician. That's where that decision belongs. Uh, and that is why I have been endorsed by Planned Parenthood uh, and by NARAL uh, in this race. Um, Steve, he had a chance uh, three years ago uh, to vote for or against the Stupak Amendment, uh, which would deny a woman the insurance coverage she would need in order to make that choice. Uh, and he voted for that amendment to deny that access. He also has voted uh, to deny a woman in the military the right overseas to be able to use a military hospital in order to have access to that health procedure. Instead, that legislation said that the woman would have to go out into the country in which that military base was in and get the care in that country. 
I don't think that's right. I think if a woman serves in our country and there's a military hospital on the base in that country, the woman should have access to that I'm, health care I'm going, service. I'm going to give Congressman yeah, a chance yeah, to respond, yeah. but, before, but, okay. no, but before I do, before yeah. I do, I will give you a chance to respond. I would like to ask Congressman Markey on this because your position on the issue has changed, and at one point you were in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade, and I'm just wondering how your position can go from wanting to overturn such a major landmark of uh, an amendment to now being in favor of abortion. Well, again, um, for 30 years, I have uh, voted on behalf of a woman's right to choose. And I came to the conclusion, Jacqueline, uh, that that decision does belong with the woman. But what with happened? Her what happened 30 years ago? There must well, have been some moment in your life that said, no, wait it, a minute, why, why, it, am I, why are we changing positions on such a major issue? It, and so drastically, too. It was no single moment. Uh, it, was, it, was an, it was an ongoing, you know, evolution in which I came to that conclusion, that, uh, that a woman should be able uh, to make that most important of all decisions, and it should be in the conversation with her physician, with her uh, family members, and, uh, and that's just the bottom line on it. Okay. And for 30 years, that's the way I have voted okay, thank consistently, you, and again, that's why Planned mm -hmm. Parenthood has endorsed me. Okay. L let, me, let me just, I want to... I wanna, uh, I want to address the, the uh, military base issue. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I'm, I've been to Iraq 14 times. I've been to Afghanistan eight times. I spent a lot of time on military bases. There is no free choice for anyone on a military base. Everything goes by rank. If, if a woman, what I, look, if a woman is pregnant, has an unwanted pregnancy on a military base, it is very likely that another uh, enlisted person, perhaps even an officer, is, is on that base as well. If, if Look, I support giving uh, maternity leave or me emergency medical leave to any woman to get off that base because when a woman is on that base under the control and command of superior officers, she does not have, she does not have free choice. I would rather give emergency leave to allow that woman to go back home and really make a full and a fair and independent decision on her own behalf in her own best interest, not being ruled over by a male uh, superior officer that may have other interests involved as well. I just think if you really want free choice, you don't, you don't make it happen on a military base. That's not the way things happen there. Thank you. We do appreciate the applause, but if we can try to hold it to the end, it would be great. We'll get into more questions, so please, if you could hold the applause. Uh, next question is for John, and John, you'll be asking it of Congressman Mark. You will respond first. Congressman, uh, Congressman um, Mark, my question is an, uh, actually on um, um, same-sex marriage. And um, this, this is my question. If the Supreme Court does not apply the Equal Protection Act to give gay couples their right to marry, would you support a constitutional amendment or law to make same-sex marriage legal in all 50 states? Um, yes, I would. Uh, in uh, 17 years ago, we had a vote on the floor of Congress, and it was on uh, DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. And uh, there were 62 people who voted no out of 435. And, uh, and I'm proud to say I was one of those 62 members of Congress who voted no on DOMA 17 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and I do believe that um, there is a constitutionally protected right um, that every person in our country uh, has equal access under the law uh, to the same privileges. And that includes the right to be married. And so I would hope that the Supreme Court would make that decision. Uh, but I also think that if necessary, that a constitutional amendment should be passed in order to guarantee uh, that uh, they are able to enjoy the very same privileges uh, that everyone else in our country is now entitled to. And thank you, John, for that question. Very important question. Thank you. Thank you, John, and, and I'm basically in agreement with Ed on that on all points. But let me, let me just say that uh, I'm also a, a, uh, a repeated uh, co-sponsor of the, uh, the Marriage Equality Act, which would 
would basically uh, repeal DOMA. Uh, I certainly think that I'm a, I'm a supporter of equal marriage. Uh, the question before the court is a narrower question about just marriage itself, but the question before the American people on this issue is really what kind of life do we want our gay brothers and sisters uh, to, to have when they're born into this world? That's the bigger question before American society. Look, I, I am blessed. I have a wonderful, wonderful marriage. And uh, I cannot m imagine my life if, if, uh, if I didn't have my wife, if I didn't have a life partner, if I didn't have a, you know, someone to, to, to share my, my life with. And uh, I think that gay couples that I know, they want the same thing. They want equality. They want the pursuit of happiness. And, and we should make sure that, that, uh, that we provide that. And I hope that the Supreme Court decides in, 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 uh, in favor of uh, gay couples having that right, constitutional right to marry. Congressman Lynch, but your position has changed on the issue regarding gay rights from the State House and now into Congress. And can you just describe why there's been an evolution in your position? I don't think the, the question ever came up for, uh, for gay marriage in Massachusetts. No gay rights. In what context? In what context? There was a few different situations. Um, one regarding um, health benefits for uh, public employees. There was um, some issues regarding that. Um, well, I actually, in, in Congress, uh, and this is going back eight years ago. What's that? When you were in the state legislature. Uh, I don't recall it specifically, but uh, if it was a question of, of, of payments, uh, you know, I, I could have voted uh, uh, in a way that was not consistent with, uh, with, uh, with uh, gay coverage, I guess. But uh, I'll tell you what my position is right now. And if it was 16 years ago or 17 years ago, um, if I voted to interfere with that, I was wrong. Uh, I do want to say that I'm, I'm actually the chairman of the committee on, well, I'm now the ranking Democrat, but I was the chairman on the committee on federal employees, and I guided through a bill that would provide same-sex coverage for the, the uh, same-sex partners of federal employees, because I believe that the federal government as an employer has to, has to lead the way. Uh, the bill was sponsored by uh, Tammy Baldwin, and uh, I had a lot to do with that bill getting through the committee and, and going on to the floor. Okay, now we're going to take a question from Twitter. And, of course, we encourage the viewers at home to be sure to – you can still participate in tonight's debate. So if you go onto Twitter and use our hashtag UMLDebate, you can go ahead and send us a question. This question is directed toward Congressman Markey. The question is, are you insulted by people – excuse me, are you insulted by being called the congressman from Chevy Chase, Maryland? Look at my uh, – my uh... – my constituents have elected me because they know that I take on the tough fights. And I go to Washington and get results for them. And they also know that the job is to go to Washington, D.C. Steve goes there, Elizabeth Warren, John Kerry, and Ted Kennedy. That's where you have to go to have these fights. And what I've tried to do is to fight the fights that ordinary families would have if they could go to Washington. That includes ensuring that you, we take assault weapons off the streets of our country and getting results in doing that. <laughs> ensuring that we have a green revolution where wind and solar and biomass and geothermal uh, plug-in hybrids, all electric vehicles become the future. That we have health insurance for every single person in the United States. And the people in Massachusetts, the people in my district, know that I have gone to Washington to fight those fights animated by the values of Malden, Massachusetts where I grow, grew up and where I live today. And they know that I am one of them as I am down there fighting these fights with the Tea Party Republicans Thank from you. across the country. Thank you. Do you What do you think about do you want that me to question? To that? Well, I, I, I know think, that you don't, I don't live in Maryland. I don't think insulted so. by being called the congressman from <laughs> based on his answer. <laughs> we use a little more time, so you can you can uh, use it, it how another, you please. Another question. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you for that. Are you playing moderator now tonight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll send it back to the student panel and Corey. You'll go ahead and you will ask your question um, to Congressman Lynch. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Lynch, there was a recent controversy at UNH regarding a Twitter account dedicated to offensive photos of students. Do you think universities have the right to shut down these accounts or punish students based on their social media activity, or is it their First Amendment right? 
Well, I, I, I must admit, Corey, I, I am unfamiliar with that, that controversy. Um, could you help me with it? Sure, I, I can. Would you like me to jump in and help yeah, you out with that? If you don't yeah. mind. So there, there was a Twitter handle, and it, um, it was uh, basically people would go on there and they would put inappropriate photos of oh. students, um, usually drunk and just really inappropriate. And so the question is whether or not it's a First Amendment issue um, to the universities get involved and be able to shut down these accounts where these students are doing inappropriate things on college campuses. Well, you know, uh, most college students are 18 years or older. Uh, it's not like you're dealing with, uh, with uh, you know, minors. These individuals are 18 years old. Uh, they can make decisions on their own. Uh, you know, and that includes mistakes, I guess. Uh, I think that uh, the better answer is to have personal responsibility for those individuals that are doing that. Um, if they're taking advantage of some, some people inappropriately, and it, it, it seems like that might be the case. I'm a little bit unclear on the circumstances, but, uh, you know, I, I do think we should have, you know, internet freedom and, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure that, you know, this, this represents a, a heavy handed approach by, by the university. If it's happening on campus, uh, 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 you know, uh, yeah, hopefully they'll, they'll take appropriate action. Um, my feeling is that, uh, if it is, uh, creating a, a climate of hate on campus, um, if it is because of the, the race of the person, the sex of the person, um, the gender of the person, the sexual orientation of the person, um, that uh, it could create a climate uh, of, uh, of hate. It could create a climate that makes people feel uncomfortable. Uh, and I think that, um, I think that there has to be a, a, a tension here that exists between someone has the right to speak, but someone also has the right to not want to listen to not want it to be able to be spread in a way that causes harm to other people. And so I agree with Steve. I mean, it does depend upon the circumstances. Uh, but, uh, but I would say that we, we should treat each one of those circumstances um, on their own. Uh, and, uh, and where the university might feel that the best interest of a vulnerable uh, subpopulation uh, within a campus are going to be harmed, uh, that perhaps an intervention is needed. And hopefully it could be done in a way in which there is a reconciliation without any um, a campus uh, punishment. Uh, thank you, but thank if you very not, much, Congressman. Okay, yes. If you don't mind. Uh, Maria, uh, you can ask a question now. Congressman Markey. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Markey, the sequester has resulted in budget cuts to discretionary funded programs such as the National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation. What will you do to ensure that important scientific research plays a uh, Research continues at places like UMass Lowell. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, sequestration is just another word for cuts, uh, mindless cuts. Uh, and you put your finger right on one of those mindless cuts, the National Institutes of Health, which are really the National Institutes of Hope. Uh, research is medicine's field of dreams from which we harvest the findings that gives hope to families that there will be a, a finding uh, a breakthrough that perhaps can make it possible for that disease which has been running through family's history is now cured. Uh, Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, um, all of them uh, are going to suffer because of these mindless Republican sequester cuts. I voted against sequestration because I thought that it would devastate um, the, uh, our state. Our state's the leading state in biomedical research. We receive per capita the largest number of NIH uh, grants. It is the engine of economic growth uh, in our state at UMass Lowell and all across the Commonwealth. It is why so many young people across the country want to come to our universities. This sequester is cutting into the business plan of Massachusetts to draw young people here to qualify for these science grants. Uh and National Science Foundation and NIH. C and Congressman, so uh, sorry, I with all due respect, will... though, would you just please answer the question, though? What exactly will you do to make sure that this funding will not be cut? With all due respect, sir. All right. Well, number one, I voted against sequestration in but we're living August with sequestration of 2011. Now. By the way, Steve voted for sequestration, and uh, I am uh, I am organizing on an ongoing basis uh, the efforts uh, to restore 
all of the funding for NIH. I have been doing that for the last uh, 10 years. I have been the leading organizer to ensure that NIH is not, in fact, cut under any circumstances. If anything, we should be dramatically increasing uh, NIH funding. And that is an effort that I have led in the Congress over the last 10 years because ultimately the real terrorist that people are afraid that's going to come into their lives is that terrifying call that another member of their family now has that disease. Thank, and thank we have an obligation much, to fund it, and thank I'm you, going to continue to be the leader in Congress to provide that funding. Thank you. Okay. Well, let, me, let me just start by saying the, the vote on sequestration uh, was designed uh, to, to make it so bad that no one would, would allow that to happen. Uh, the president asked us, the, this, the country was at a position of default. We were going to default on our debt, $16 trillion in debt. It would have devastated this country. It would have caused many of the same layoffs and cuts that we're talking about here in sequestration. What the president's idea was, was to vote for sequestration and to give ourselves about 18 more months to deal with going through the budget with a scalpel and cutting out areas that, uh, that uh, were less desirable, a lot of those in the defense budget. So we tried that. The, uh, the, the uh, special committee did not, the, uh, the uh, special committee did not come up with a, a plan and the sequestration bid failed. So we are, we are facing that. What we have to do is try to get people to come together and look at the budget anew. We have to look at uh, uh, total reform of, of our budget so that we go back and put the money back into areas that need them and take out uh, money that for, for defense projects, for example, that uh, neither the Defense Department or, or the President nor the Joint Chiefs of Staff actually want to go forward and, uh, and continue. So we have to reorder our priorities within the budget. Congressman Lynch, to play Monday morning quarterback, though, knowing now what you know, do you wish that you didn't make that vote that allowed for sequestration to happen? You're asking me whether I would rather have the country default on $16.3 trillion in debt. No, I, I wouldn't. That's not a good option either. Uh, remember, that much debt, $16.3 trillion, if you raise the interest rate on that by, by 1%, it, it wipes out our, enti our entire budget. So the idea here, and, and, and by the way, we have a lot, a lot of young people here. The $16.7 trillion in debt we have right now is on you. It's on your backs. And uh, it's, threatening, it's threatening our ability to maintain a, a decent standard of living in this country. So, you know, to, to, have, to have that debt put on their shoulders and to vote no on giving us a chance to figure a way out of this mess, you know, I, I think was, uh, was a poor choice as well. Okay, moving forward to the next question now. Sure. If you are elected to the U.S. Senate, name two areas you can find common ground with Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Congressman Markey. Um, well, it wouldn't be on uh, energy policy. Uh, <laughs> let me think. Two areas. Uh, well, you know, I, I have found um, in the... Uh, telecommunications uh, area. Uh, I have been able to find uh, common ground with him, for example, in the deployment of rural broadband uh, in ensuring that every American uh, has access to this necessary technology uh, in the 21st century. And I've been partnering with those uh, rural states and leaders like uh, Mitch McConnell uh, to make sure that there is a democratization of access to opportunity through broadband, through uh, information uh, technologies. Uh, I would also um, say that we probably agree uh, on the necessity of ensuring that uh, veterans in our country are protected, uh, that they are given what they are due, having returned from the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. And my hope is that we, we would be able to work together in a bipartisan fashion uh, to recognize the need that every one of these people, as they come back, having served our country, are not forgotten because that happened too much in the past, and we cannot allow it to happen again. Thank you, Congressman. Well, I certainly think that the VA issue is one that we've had, uh, we've had agreement on before. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, during my time in, uh, in Congress, I've had an opportunity to serve on the Veterans Affairs Committee for a while. Uh, there was some agreement there. We have more work to do, however. Uh, I think that uh, I think there is some 
bipartisanship on, on that issue, on, on the veterans' care issue. Uh, we have a lot of challenges in, in front of us, however. I think the other issue might be, and I, I'm not clear on this, uh, there might be some transportation. I honestly am at a disadvantage because I don't know what he's thinking. Uh, what, uh, <laughs> well, that's not going to help with bipartisanship, it, it, it just, will it? <laughs> well, a lot of the stuff he's coming up with, you know, I went through my checklist, and there's not a whole lot there that I agree with him on, to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't... Uh, I can't really put my finger on anything else. Maybe on some transportation issues, I'm not, I'm not really clear on that. But uh, uh, I, I, if you ask me a bunch of the, if I could name 20 issues I disagree with them on, I could come up with those pretty quick, though. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now we have another question from Twitter. This, co this comes from College Starved. Uh, this person asks, I'm graduating with tons of debt. What can you do to control the cost of college? And we'll start with Congressman Lynch. Sure. Well, uh, look, I... I graduated college. It'll seem like a small amount, but with about $80,000 in student loans, uh, I struggled with them. I did. Uh, you know, I fell behind on one. And uh, my wife used to kid me that, uh, you know, since I went to school later and went to school part time in evenings, that uh, that I would be they would be attaching my Social Security check to pay off my student loans. Uh, and she was only half joking. Uh, but one of the things that I have look since I since I've been through that, like a lot of people in this room. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor of the Student Loan Fairness Act, and what that does is it actually provides for a lower student loan uh, interest rate. Uh, right now, it's about three and a half, three point eight percent for student loans, much lower than it has been historically. And uh, but if Congress doesn't act, if Ed and I and others cannot act soon enough, it'll go back up to either 7% or 7.5%. And a lot of the students in this room are coming out with much bigger debt loads than, than I did when I came out of school. So, but but I'm, I'm, I'm working on that. We're going to try to get that passed. And the other thing is what the president talked about in his State of the Union address, which is try to force down the, uh, the cost of, you know, the, the overall cost, the tuition bills that you're all being uh, presented with. Thank you very much. Congressman Markey. Um, right now, there's $1 trillion worth of student debt in our country, and that is a national disgrace. Uh, that kind of burden really makes it difficult for young people to be able to realize their dreams. Uh, it is buried under this incredible burden which is imposed upon them. Um, I'm the first person in my family to have ever gone to college. I had to be a commuter living at home all the way through college and all the way through law school, uh, earning my own tuition, but I needed student loans to be able to make it. Uh, and I think that's pretty much what the UMass Lowell student body looks like. You know, they need help. Uh, many of them are just first generation going to college the way I was. Uh, and so, like Steve, we need to lower those interest rates uh, to make sure that they're more affordable. Uh, secondly, uh, in the um, stimulus bill, Back in 2009, we put in $70 billion worth of more Pell Grant of money and other funding for students to be able uh, to go to school. And I like the idea that President Obama is now talking about, uh, where we would link the amount of federal aid that colleges get with how stabilized the cost of going to school is. Uh, so that there isn't an arms race where the more money that comes in is the higher the tuition goes and the kids are never any better off and they wind up uh, having to borrow just the same amount of money. So we need those kind of reforms so that we protect these kids uh, from having their dreams shattered by carrying that debt burden for a generation. Thank you very much. And John, last question. Congressman Lynch, my second question is on, on the use of military drones. Um, and it reads like uh, Senator Ron Paul recently filibusted to force the administration to respond to concerns about drone strikes. What do you think the criteria should be to use drones to kill enemy con combatants, including those who are American citizens? Uh, I, I think it prevents a very tough situation. I've actually spent time in, uh, as I say, I've been in uh, Afghanistan about eight times. Uh, I've reviewed some of the, uh, the bases that are actually operating there. Uh, I've sat with Pakistani opposition leaders uh, in, in the, the frontier province and talked about uh, the amount of visceral opposition that comes from uh, the, the, the local tribes people 
when a, when a drone kills an innocent person. Uh, so clearly, uh, what we've done here is, uh, is, is by, by, the, by incautious use of, of drones, we've really hurt ourselves, hurt our standing in, in, in many ways. Uh, these are tough choices. By being on the ground there, I also see that in some cases, if someone, if there are a group like with Al Qaeda that are intending to, to harm innocent Americans and we don't have the ability to bring those people into custody or it's too dangerous to put U.S. Uh, servicemen and women on the ground in that area, we have very limited choices. And uh, there may be cases where it, it is the only option to use is, is to use one of those drones. Um, thank you for that question. Um, this gives me a chance to uh, agree with the other Republican senator from Kentucky. Uh, so I've already told you where I agree with Mitch McConnell. Now I'll tell you, I agreed with uh, Rand Paul. Uh, I agree with the filibuster that he conducted. I'm glad that he stood up. I'm glad that he demanded answers on what was the policy of the United States in uh, deploying these drones. Uh, the American people, through the Congress, through the House and the Senate, they have a right to answers uh, about uh, who makes the decisions as to when these drones are used. Uh, who are the targets uh, of these drones? Uh, could the targets have been apprehended uh, without the use of the drones? Did the target pose any kind of an imminent threat to the United States? Would the use of the drones, in fact, create so much collateral damage that the law of unintended consequences is, in fact, invoked and more harm is done to our interests? All of those questions should be answered. Uh, and I'm glad that Rand Paul, Republican from Kentucky, raised those issues. And it's a good way to use the filibuster uh, in the Senate in order to demand from any administration answers to important questions that the American people are entitled to. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for participating in tonight's debate, sponsored by UMass Lowell and, of course, the Boston Herald. Now, we will begin with Congressman Lynch for a one-minute closing remarks. Well, first of all, thank, thank you, UMass Lowell, for having us here, Marty Meehan uh, and the Herald. My candidacy is, 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 is very simply put. When you look at the United States Senate, it is populated today by, by a very narrow uh, group of, of uh, somewhat elite and, and, and privileged individuals, for the most part, for the most part. And I think that there is time, this is the time, to elect someone who grew up in public housing, who put on a pair of work boots and worked for a living, who struggled through part-time school, evening school, and has a lot of the experience that a lot of people in this room have. I'm not saying that every U.S. senator should have worked for a living. I'm not saying that every U.S. senator should have stood in an unemployment line. I'm not saying that every U.S. senator should have, you know, struggled through night school to get a, to get a degree. I'm just saying one U.S. senator, one U.S. senator should have had that experience and bring that perspective to the United States Senate on behalf of you all. And I'd be honored to do that. Thank you. Thank you to UMass Lowell. Thank you to Chancellor Meehan. Thank you to the Boston Herald. This is a very important forum. Um, my father grew up in Merrimack Valley. My father grew up on the first floor of a triple-decker at 88 Phillips Street in South Lawrence, one of five children, in the shadow of the mills. And uh, I went back there about three years ago when uh, the youngest of the five children that grew up there passed away, my Aunt Margie. And, uh, and I rang the doorbell to see who lived there now on the first floor of 88 Phillips Street, the first floor of a triple-decker. And the door opened, and it was a Dominican family with their children. And the accents were different, but the aspirations clearly the same, that they want 
for their children what the Marquis were able to receive living in that triple-decker. And I think that's our responsibility, and that's the responsibility of anyone who goes to the United States Senate, to make sure that the 21st century is more educated, more healthy, more clean, and more fair than the 20th century. And that every child on every porch, not just in Lawrence, but in every city and town across our country, is able to maximize their God-given abilities. They're 20% of the population, but 100% of our future. And I'm running for the United States Senate in order to make sure that that future is made possible uh, for each and every one of those families. And again, I thank UMass Lowell for having this kind of discussion. a big round of applause, of course, to the students who did such a great job here tonight. We want to thank everyone at home for watching the U.S. Senate debate. Be sure to vote on the primary day, which is, of course, April 30th, and the special election, June 25th. And I'd be remiss if I did not give a big shout out to the men's hockey team who have a big game on Thursday, so best of luck to you guys. I'm Jocelyn Cashman. Have a wonderful night. Thank mm -hmm. you.